Uh, right, so I guess I'll talk about, uh, this is basically, I think it's, what is it, Applied JS. Um, but this talk, I think we'll talk about sort of the architecture of Iris Couch and maybe touch on NPM. And uh, really, more or less, this is just kind of a success story, uh, like a feel good kind of success story. So just, I hope you can like, I don't know, sit back and feel good. Uh, so I'm Jason Smith. I, uh, I'm an Apache CouchDB committer, and uh, I'm sort of the top of the food chain of technology at Iris Couch. And so what we do, Iris Couch is basically a CouchDB in the cloud. If you can spell your name, you just punch it in and you get CouchDB. That's the idea. And uh, what, I, what we noticed is that we use JavaScript a lot. It's basically all Node.js. And so I thought that was interesting. Uh, what, like, why did we just kind of, not really intentionally, but we just, I sort of looked back and realized, Jesus, it's just all JavaScript now. It's all Node.js, and that's weird. So I'll start. Uh, this is William James, uh, uh, sort of turn of the 20th, of the 19th century, uh, 20th century, philosopher, American philosopher, talking about Freud. And the problem is, not actually Freud, but Freudian, uh, proponents sort of move the goalpost. It's hard to kind of address their arguments because uh, everything's sort of, I don't know, in your subconscious or whatever. It's like a really a, a tough uh, nut to crack to sort of bring reason to Freudian to sort of crash that kind of party. So this is sort of his feeling about that. This is 1890. But the malcontents will hardly try to refute our reasonings by direct attack. It is more probable that, turning their back upon them altogether, they will devote themselves to sapping and mining the region roundabout, until it is a bog of logical liquefaction, into the midst of which all definite conclusions of any sort, even Q sort, uh, quick sort, may be trusted ere long to sink and disappear. Uh, I like that, a bog of logical liquefaction. That's awesome, I don't know what that is. I think that's a perfect description of internet discourse, pretty much writ large. Uh, Twitter, everything. Um, I think the idea is, do you know like Stephen Colbert, uh, Truthy, remember Truthy and uh, what was it, Wikiality? I think it's the same kind of idea that uh, uh, controlling attention is more important than controlling, uh, than sort of making a good argument or being rational or something like that. I, I, I think that's his idea and he's sort of frustrated with uh, Freudians, and I'm frustrated with Twitter, so I love this bog of logical liquefaction. When I uh, meet people in the street, uh, just like strangers or something like that, I'm, uh, the, for, for me, I see a face and the, the, just these kind of thoughts and emotions just kind of spring to mind. Uh, for me personally, I think the first thing I see uh, when I see a stranger is probably their gender. And the second thing, race, right? Like that, it's just, it's literally that fast. And I, I know what the word means. It's that fast. And so the superficial stuff, right? It's not really uh, meaningful. It's certainly not useful to draw conclusions from that. It's just my first thought, always, the first thing that, that, that comes to mind. Um, and so I thought that's interesting because I think people kind of look at, com at programming languages in a similar way. What I'm saying is a lot of superficial argumentation uh, around. Uh, this is my wife uh, on a field trip, a uh, school trip. Um, my, uh, you know, I have a, uh, my junior high school classmate is somewhere in this room, Jeff. Uh, we, yeah, we went to Colonial Williamsburg and she met John Paul II, so I'm totally jealous. Uh, but anyway, uh, when I met her, I saw a Chinese woman, right? And that was really all I knew about, about her, the first kind of moment I saw her. So that was years ago, we dated and we married. And what I noticed recently is uh, now when I see her, when I come home or something, and I see my wife's face, it, uh, uh, race and gender d doesn't really come to mind. I see this person I've got this long relationship uh, with. I sort of, I think, I, I think I feel the current status and the entire history of this relationship that I've built with this person. Um, it's like, you know, oh, what was that thing I, I, I needed to tell her? Or, oh, uh, you know, I miss her right now. Or I hate her guts. Or like, whatever it is, it's a, it's a relationship. And it's meaningful. It's not 
uh, it's not superficial. Um, so I think my point is I ha I've built a substantial relationship now. It's, it kind of means something. It's worth it to evaluate, uh, uh, to evaluate that relationship, not the superficial stuff. Same thing with my in-laws and my family, right? I don't see a Chinese man. I see my father-in-law. How's his health? Whatever, you know. So really, all of this is kind of a long way to say that uh, I don't really actually think I like JavaScript. I don't really care. I don't care. It's, I, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't really like it. It's, it's just what I, I don't know. It, I, don't, I don't really care. I don't really have any thoughts about it. Sort of in the same way that I don't really see the superficial aspects of people who I know. Um, but yet, I checked my Git history recently, two years of Iris Couch work, and 10 to 1, the number one language in our, in our internal code is JavaScript. It's Node.js. And it's just nothing but Node.js. The next language is Erlang. And so I thought that's bizarre. I never thought that I liked JavaScript, but the evidence is in. And like, there it is. It's just nothing but Node.js. So uh, that's sort of what inspired me to kind of come up with this talk, is, uh, is, uh, is solving this mystery as to why, uh, why that happened. And so I guess now I'll stop kind of, you know, it's kind of a long way of saying we use Node.js is really what I'm saying. And so I guess what I'll move to is just the architecture of Iris Couch, like how it works, uh, how this sort of web service works. Iris, uh, CouchDB is HTTP only. So basically we run websites. We run web servers. Um, so let's see. This is a sort of basic idea. Um, this is a, what, uh, what is it, uh, graph viz graph. Um, the only thing not displayed on this graph is this, this sort of state. My kind of my idea is if it's square, it's a computer. And if it's an oval, if it's an ellipse, it's not a computer. It's software or something. Um, what's not displayed on here is every computer here sort of has universal access to this state. Obviously, it's a couch database. Um, CQS is also there. You can Google it. CQS is just a job uh, queue system that I wrote. It's actually a 100% knockoff of Amazon SQS, 100% the same, just runs on CouchDB. And so all of our jobs and, and uh, you know, running backups and starting up servers and all of this sort of thing, new signups, all of that goes through this job queue. So I didn't connect the lines because it was ugly. So it kind of moves from left to right. There's clients, there's proxies, there's uh, workhorses. I just needed a name. Um, and then CouchDB is running, so I'll kind of walk you through this. Uh, the idea is you start with a client, maybe a web browser uh, or, or whatever, or, or some sort of HTTP client. For example, we're going to foo.iriscouch.com. So the first thing that happens is obviously a DNS lookup. This DNS server, it's called NameD. It's on GitHub. You can Google that. And it's 100% uh, Node.js. I wrote a parser. And uh, what's the opposite of a parser? I don't even remember. Whatever that is, a, a, an unparser. Um, to basically uh, understand and respond to DNS queries. And so this DNS server, so for example, the, the client is looking up foo.iriscouch.com. This DNS server knows the state of everything because it's got a uh, feed from CouchDB. And so in that state is the IP address of everybody, right? We know where everything is. And so the DNS server says, ah, that is at some IP address to the client. So the client moves forward. Uh, and hits these reverse proxies. This is the only thing at Iris Couch really that's, that's not CouchDB, which is not Node.js. It's Erlang. And that's sort of historical. It was always Erlang, and I never rewrote it. Um, I kind of want to. There's some good, I don't want to. It works really well. But there's some really good Node.js reverse proxies now. Uh, so I'm kind of interested in that. But anyway, these proxies, once again, need to know the state. So they hit the state database, or they know the state database. Uh, and the question is, which workhorse is this couch on? You know, there's just this army of machines in the back. And so that's also known. Those proxies know that, and they basically forward the request right through um, to these workhorses. And so on this workhorse, for example, there's foo.iriscouch.com. This is kind of my, my mental model of how it works. I hope it's your mental model, too. Uh, we'll have impedance mismatch. And so there things go kind of from the back end through the proxy to the front end, back to the proxy, through to the back end, and so forth. Um, so there's, uh, I think there's a couple of things that I didn't, uh, 
that I kind of skipped over that are just optimizations. But this is basically the idea. These proxies, they can crash. Um, and so if they crash, the state is updated. This proxy is down. And so obviously the DNS server will stop answering with that IP address and so we kind of standard high availability and, uh, and th that sort of thing. But this is basically the idea. What's really interesting is I think in my mind, actually literally this is basically a data center, proxy A, proxy B, all the way to the right, pretty much a data center. So we can have other data centers, right, and we can spread things out. Um, these are, I think, we, what do we call them, uh, uh, availability clusters, service clusters. And the idea is these are isolated from each other. These proxies are isolated. Everything's kind of nice and isolated. So all of these servers can crash. And in the other data centers, everything's fine. Um, so this is kind of more or less how, how that works. Um, what I did is, this is CouchDB Baz. Baz is actually instantiated in this other hypothetical data center too. And that's CouchDB. So what we've got is replication code, uh, um, kind of management code, keeping all of that synchronized. So in, you can have the same server, uh, foo.iriscouch.com. I guess he didn't pay enough money, so he doesn't get mere, you know, replication in multiple data centers. But Baz did, I guess, in this, in this universe. So we've got this sort of replication code, keeping all of that organized, keeping all of that good. I think when people say CouchDB is slow, what I would like to say is, well, we have identical data in every data center in the world. And so we can guarantee 50 millisecond ping times uh, everywhere. Read, write, everything's totally transparent. Um, so that would be my answer to the, to the charge that CouchDB is slow. Um, one thing that, uh, that I would like to do in the future, by the way, speaking of Node.js, is I think would be fun, CouchDB can have conflicts. If you don't know CouchDB, uh, basically every document, every you know, blob of data is like a Git repository. It's got this timeline, you can branch, you can merge. It's pretty much the same thing. Uh, in, so I would like to write some software to maybe automatically resolve those conflicts. By the way, um, Git was invented by a nice European man. And so when the data diverges, it's, it's a branch. And CouchDB was invented by a nice American. And Americans love violence. And so it's a conflict, but same thing. So, so the model's the same. I'd like to do that. I think it'd be fun. What, uh, so what I'm really getting at is, we, this is actually, we pretty much literally have this uh, in there. This is Isaac's server. Isaac, spelled with an S, it's hard to say. But anyways, this is, this is actually how NPM looks uh, uh, today. Um, reverse proxies, no single points of failure, blah, blah, blah. And this is totally isolated. So I don't know if you follow, if you like search for Iris Couch, people complaining about downtime. Uh, typically, that does not affect NPM or vice versa. So that's the isolation that we've got. Um, the replication works across data centers. So our next goal, our immediate goal starting next week is probably uh, open a, basically run a mirror in, in Europe somewhere, maybe Australia also. Uh, which country should I do, by the way? Or which data center? Maybe Amsterdam? What do you think? Yeah, maybe Lisbon, I don't know, yeah. So, um, so this, is, uh, this is pretty much how NPM works. Interestingly, we can actually do this exact same architecture on a LAN, like in, a, like in your office or something like that. So I'd like to try that sometime, is have these DNS servers, you know? So you, you don't change anything on NPM, and you just say, you know, NPM install uh, something. There's a DNS lookup, and these servers say, oh yeah, you're that guy, you're, IP address is 192.168. Whatever, and there's these local mirrors in your, you know, in your building or something like that, and it's lightning fast. I think that would be awesome. Um, so that's kind of the next goal. What we uh, what we just moved to, sorry, what we just um, I think started doing. What am I doing? What we just. Uh, I think tried to do, and, and really I guess today I'm sort of announcing this, is we, uh, we took this NPM idea and we said, well, if we can mirror NPM, what I really like about GitHub is private repositories and uh, the ability to have you know, open source and closed source, and it's all kind of nice and together. So what we've got now kind of cooking is basically the same thing for NPM. And so, uh, uh, actually, you can go to irisnpm.com. It's like a, it's like a uh, just launched. It's um, 
What do they say? If you're not embarrassed by your launch, then you waited too long. Is that right? Because I'm totally embarrassed by the website. But I'm proud of the embarrassment, so it's fine. But uh, yeah, so you can go to irisnbm.com, uh, like uh, ask for an in invitation, and uh, get in the queue. And so the idea is exactly like GitHub, you've got um, private publishing and private sharing of closed source packages. So I think that, I think that may be interesting. Uh, I'm not sure it's a bit of an experiment. And so this is sort of our objective. So that is, that's how we use Node.js. That's how we use JavaScript. Um, I don't really do it on the browser much at all. But it's been just the right fit. It just kind of fits like an old sneaker for management, maintenance, running backups, queuing up, uh, queuing up jobs to be done, all of that stuff. For some reason, it's just felt really comfortable in JavaScript, and I've just kept doing it. And so that's why the, uh, I don't know, that's why we have this success story. So if you're a front-end developer, or if you are, um, I don't know, if you're struggling with back-end stuff, I think back-end databases, the data layer is kind of fundamentally difficult. And so maybe this, this, I don't know if it excuses it, but maybe it helps explain why, like keeping things up, it's such a pain. And so maybe that will elucidate the problem. I think a, a, a goal in the future would be that front-end developers have a, a, a bit more convenient way to develop apps without thinking about all of this. That's basically our goal. So I hope that sort of clarifies it, and I hope that explains my opinion about why to use Node.js. I think I use JavaScript pretty much for the same reason Gary Smith, my father, votes Republican in every election. Um, all my friends use Node.js, and uh, I trust my friends. So that's it. That's why we use it. Cheers.